Uh, I'm going to be talking about crowdfunding of place-based conservation and um, I guess we're all interested in various ways in conservation and saving the planet but there are real limitations to what we as individuals can do in that respect. For example, I guess uh, I might like to give thousands of pounds to uh, help conservation projects, but I don't necessarily have thousands of pounds myself spare to do so. Likewise, um, conservation can take some expertise and the person in the streets might not feel that they have expertise uh, to join um, to, to initiate conservation projects themselves. And also the conservation world currently experiences some concerns over the idea of cultural imperialism, um, imposing views on how to conserve wildlife on, on other cultures, other nations, for example. Although of course we are allowed to have opinions about conservation in other places, the, this concern over cultural imperialism can be a barrier. So what I'm going to talk about uh, today is the idea that crowdfunding is a means by which we as local people to our, our own areas can actually join together to become highly impactful as conservationists, regardless of our income uh, or regardless of our expertise or our social connections and so on. And to illustrate this idea, I'm going to talk about three different case studies of crowdfunded place-based conservation, uh, two within Wales and uh, one a little bit uh, further uh, in Greater Wales uh, on the Devon-Cornwall border. So let's start with the first of these case studies, Coydnant Bran, it's a woodland in Paris. Um, Coydnant Bran um, is a wood that was um, advertised for sale in the autumn winter of 2016 and uh, at that time I was looking for uh, interesting field sites so I was keeping an eye on websites like the Woodlands for Sale website that we see a, a screenshot of here and a lot of the woods that come up for sale on these uh, Woodlands for Sale sites are to be honest quite quite rubbish woods. They're, they're often ex-conifer plantations um, with a scattering of remnants, broadleaf uh, native woodlands, but uh, need an awful lot of uh, work and, and uh, removal of, of non-native conifers and so on to, to restore them to a good ecological condition. Whereas Nant Bran wood here, um, just uh, west of Brecon and the Brecon Beacons, um, is a really uh, pristine looking ancient Welsh oak woodland. And uh, I immediately pricked up my ears and looked at this website with great interest as, as a potential uh, site uh, to organize acquiring. And the downside to that was the 80,000 price tag, 80,000 pounds was uh, not in my pockets at the time by any means. And so um, with colleagues uh, in the Eco Explore organisation that I'm associated with, um, we put together a crowd fund in order to try and raise that amount of money. And so uh, putting together a crowd fund is actually quite fun. Um, you you get, gather together photos, you um, write a little rationale for why um, this is a good conservation project, and you put it online and start to advertise it on social media. And of course, um, the days go by and um, contributions start to come in. It's very exciting to see you got past the first thousand pounds, the first two thousand pounds and so on. And um, as we went on, contributions really start to slow, started to slow down after four or five um, thousand pounds. And it turned out I didn't know that many millionaires in order to ask for money in this regard. But what this crowdfund did was attract the interest and attention of a major contributor who uh, one day during that crowdfund um, phoned me up and offered to buy the site outright and to um, hand it over in trust for perpetuity for research, conservation and education. And that was a real delight to me and I've been associated with the woodland involved in its management ever since. So it's a permanent land use agreement for those three purposes, research, conservation 
and education. And so through EcoExplore um, and Cardiff University and the other um, regional universities, we've been using this woodland now as a field site. And the first year of studies was what we might call a bioblitz approach to describe the biodiversity, to work out what's there. And we'll have a little look at the biodiversity in a moment. But then after the first year, we've really moved into um, the start of long-term monitoring, experimental research and management of the woodland to maximise its biodiversity, which is already uh, quite a rich site, as we'll see. So where is the woodland? Um, it's near the village of Flambehangel and Bran in the Bracken Beacons. It's uh, west of Bracken, near the uh, slightly larger village of Sennybridge. And here is um, Flanvihangel Nantbran city centre, uh, comprising about eight or ten houses, a church and a farm. And uh, just up the lane from the village is Coid Nantbran, Nantbran Wood. And this is the, the location uh, that we were able to acquire. And the woodland is, is actually quite diverse in itself. The top half, the northern half, is a fairly pure stand of oak and the bottom half um, has quite a checkered history and it's quite a, a mixed woodland, lots of different species and with, a, with an interesting history to it. So this ancient oak woodland and this very mixed secondary woodland. And so we started looking at the, the woodland area in the old maps available and the woodland as it currently stands covers the whole of this area which includes parts of um, what were open fields in 1887, as well as the ancient oak, oak woodland in the northern half. So keep an eye on these shapes of the fields and um, we can see that as we go from 1887 to 1904, we've moved from these being um, designated as pasture fields to rather um, rough grassland with this uh, woodland section in between and the, the ancient woodland uh, up above. So we go further forwards in time, again we've got the same sort of overall shape but still open fields uh, into the 1920s and even within the, the secondary woodland area there are still open patches, there's a, a big glade of bracken uh, in the middle of the woodland in, within this area. So it's quite a, a diverse area and the, the wildlife and the ecology reflects that division between the ancient oak um, woodland that was previously used as a coppice. In other words, the, uh, the timber, the tall trees and the underwood would be cut back um, almost to ground level on a rotation of every, every 30 to 40 years probably. And that was uh, seemingly still going on up to the 1930s. Uh, but there's been 90 years or so where the ancient oak has been no longer used as a coppice and so uh, the timber trees are, are now pretty tall, um, 90 year old or so stand of oak. So one of our uh, undergraduate students um, during that time, Eve Treadaway, has done some uh, nice mapping of these areas and um, here we see the, the ancient oak uh, coppice and um, the area defined in green is the area that, that uh, we own. Uh, this section uh, further north be belongs to the, the adjacent farm. And the red areas here are ancient oak boundaries. So these are uh, essentially the, the ancient uh, hedgerows that were dividing those open fields, which are now surrounded by newer mixed woodland. <clears throat> and in this bottom area, there's a, a nice little area of hazel coppice. Uh, managed in the same sort of way as the oak coppice, uh, but a different, different uh, standard, a different species hazel. So our studies have included um, quite a lot of mapping and tagging trees. Um, here's the first ever uh, tree that was tagged. This tree has subsequently fallen over. And a lot of the, the, um, the trees that you see when you just look at the woodland are actually standing dead wood. So it's a nice mixture. Uh, it's about 25% of the trunks that you see there are dead and uh, are, are, are gradually rotting and, and uh, fall over over time. We've also been looking at um, regeneration of the woodland by tagging a little seedlings and saplings. And what we're finding is that a seedling like this can be 
um, three or four years old and still be absolutely tiny. Um, it seems like there's a whole cohort of seedlings just waiting for gaps to open up in the canopy as the older trees start to die and fall over. In fact, here is Eve Treadaway with a, a gang of her uh, university mates um, setting up some of the mapping and, and seedling tagging within these quadrats. So we'll just have a little um, whistle top tour of some of the biodiversity of the, the wood and the sorts of monitoring and recording that we're doing. Uh, a lot of the um, work in my research group is to do with birds and so we do a lot of uh, nest recording. Here's a nest of a black cap uh, which then turns into uh, nice hatched chicks which then get rings put on their legs and uh, we can chart the survival and um, uh, fortunes of these breeding bird populations. Lots of different species in the woods. Here's a nice um, example of a long-tailed tit's nest made of lichen and spider's webs. And um, here's the, the long-tailed tit uh, peeping out. So these nests get vi visited carefully under license and the, uh, the progress of the eggs and the chicks get recorded. So we can get a good idea of breeding success. The woodland is also filled now with nest boxes. And um, these nest boxes are um, effectively um, supplementing the natural tree hole cavities for species of um, considerable conservation concern, including the pied flycatcher here. Um, it's a classic, iconic bird of the Welsh oak, wo oak woodlands and uplands. And uh, we tend to think of them as, as classic Welsh birds, but actually these are birds that spend the winter far to the south across the Sahara uh, in the Sahel zone, of, uh, of Africa and a little bit further south into West Africa and stopping off on migration in North Africa and Portugal on the way back to Wales. So we might think of them as Welsh birds visiting Africa but we can also think of them as African birds visiting Wales and so their conservation is a, is a global issue. Um, but these are birds that are struggling at the moment. Um, this is the population change in pied flycatchers in the UK over recent decades and they've undergone quite a, a rapid and dramatic population crash. So uh, compared to the population um, in the last few years, uh, population in 1995 was more than uh, twice as high. So the conservation of woodland birds, including the pied flycatcher, is something that we're very interested in monitoring and managing for at Coydnant Bran. And that involves checking the nest boxes, um, counting eggs, sometimes um, collecting food, a uh, caterpillar here that the bird has dropped um, as it's uh, entering the nest. And then once the chicks hatch, measuring and weighing the chicks, collecting their poo to find out what they've been eating uh, by extracting DNA from the, from the bird's poo. And eventually the chicks um, grow their flight feathers and fledge and so we can get a, a good idea of the fledging success in different years. We just completed the fourth year of, um, of nest box monitoring at Nant Bran. So as well as looking at the birds themselves we're also interested in the birds food and when that food is available and whether that food is enough to fledge a healthy brood of chicks. And one way of doing that is to monitor the caterpillars which are the main food source uh, during chick rearing for the pie flycatchers. And we can do that, um, slightly bizarre method, by collecting caterpillar poo, or frass, that's just another word for poo. Um, caterpillars live up in the oak canopy and as they're feeding on newly unfurling oak leaves, uh, they're pooing and the poo is, the frass is raining gently uh, down from the canopy. And so uh, some of our long suffering students, Jez Smith, Libby Brooks, Harriet Power, um, they've been collecting caterpillar frass in these uh, sieves hanging from the canopy. And by drying and weighing the frass, we can get an estimate of changes over the breeding season of um, caterpillar biomass. And you can see there's quite a sharp peak uh, in the timing of caterpillar biomass abundance. And this defines when it's optimal for the pie flycatchers to be hatching their chicks. So the flycatchers want to hatch their chicks just as the caterpillar peak is uh, re nearing its maximum. So that when their uh, chicks are hungry in the nest, they've got lots of uh, abundant food uh, to keep stuffing into their mouths. 
But you can see that the size of the caterpillar peak varies quite a lot between years. 2017 had a lower peak than 2016. And the timing as well shifts around between years according to uh, the temperature of the spring, especially. So monitoring bird food is an important part of monitoring bird breeding success. And bird food itself depends on the oak trees uh, that form a large part of, of Nant Bran. Nant Bran is actually part of a whole network of woodland sites that we've been looking at over the past five years um, to chart seasonal and uh, geographical variation in the timing of oak leaf burst. And here, here's a set of photos of oak leaves um, on the first laying date of pied flycatchers uh, in a particular year. You can see that at Coidnant Bran, up in the Bracken Beacons, on that date, oak leaves are just starting to unfurl. They're very tender, uh, good food for caterpillars. Um, whereas down in Cardiff, at lower altitude and lower latitude, um, oak leaves are already well grown and starting to fill up with tannins, which makes the leaves unpalatable to caterpillars. So um, flycatchers want to be laying their eggs just as oak leaves are starting to unfurl. And that means when the chicks are um, uh, reaching their, their peak need of food, uh, caterpillars will be really abundant. So over the last summer, especially, we've been uh, looking at um, altitudinal, latitudinal, longitudinal variation in oak leaf growth with Nant Bran as a key part of that network. So a big part of the rationale for monitoring at Nant Bran is that it's never too late to start a long-term data set. And um, by establishing these nest boxes in the wood and looking at other parts of the uh, ecological system that the birds rely on, um, we've got four years now and that'll continue um, to accumulate into the future because the site is there in perpetuity as a field site uh, for these sorts of long-term research projects. So from year to year and from species to species, we could get a very good idea uh, from the 61 nets box boxes uh, across the woodland of the breeding success and how that changes over time. So a look, little look at some of the other biodiversity in the woodland. Um, there's quite a, a big population of badgers within the woods. Uh, here we see the locations of uh, badger uh, set entrances. Uh, the red are the active set entrances and there's various uh, inactive um, holes as well. It's a very big um, uh, concentration of, of uh, badgers, uh, badger set entrances in, in, the, uh, in the secondary woodland. And here we see the, the set entrance um, surrounded by literally generations of diggings from badgers turfing out soil and rocks uh, and old bedding um, from their from their sets as they as they clean out their their living area. Sometimes what they clean out is the remains of uh, other badgers. So we sometimes find um, skulls and other bones in those diggings. The site uh, also has. Um, polecats which are seen occasionally and um, this is a whole family of polecats which uh, uh, encountered crossing the road one uh, summer evening and um, we also have um, some video footage of the of the polecats if I just escape from here if I can and go to the internet. Here we have um, on Nant Brown Wood Facebook page. So the woodland has its own Facebook page, which you're very welcome to join. And um, here's a little video clip um, created by some of our finally a project students of uh, a polecat foraging around in a meadow just next to the woodland. So let's go back to the main presentation. So polecats are one of these species that uh, were very rare in the UK and have um, really bounced back due to um, protection and, and um, reduction in persecution. We also have some rare bats in the woodland. Um, the Barbastel bat um, was uh, detected by a uh, colleague Stephen Davison uh, who um, has um, established the, the presence of this uh, rear bat which favours ancient woodlands. It's a nationally scarce species, uh, so this is a new site uh, for that species in Wales. And included in, in the bat work is acoustic monitoring. Uh, this is my colleague James Fafidis of the University of West of England, 
um, and James has been looking at uh, use of different parts of the woodland canopy, the woodland structure, uh, by different species of bats with these passive uh, acoustic monitoring devices. Other biodiversity includes reptiles, there's slow worms, common lizards, uh, there's amphibians, frogs and toads, and lots of invertebrates. And part of our long-term monitoring, uh, it's not just about birds, includes butterfly transacts, uh, soil invertebrates, and so on. Uh, here's uh, another colleague, PhD student, uh, Amy Schwartz, um, uh, helping with some of the moth trappings. There's a wide diversity of uh, moth species within the woodland, reflecting, you know, it's uh, ancient woodland is a, a really biodiverse uh, habitat. And there are lots of taxa as well, still yet to explore in, in detail. So there's a wide diversity of, of fungi. Um, this is fly agaric, uh, many of you recognize an amethyst deceiver, uh, this uh, lovely little purple uh, fungus. So that's just a little whistle stop tour of uh, Nant Bran Wood, called Nant Bran. Um, it was chosen for fundraising, uh, crowdfunding, and conservation because it was typical. Um, not because it was special, but it turns out that the more that you look at a place and get to know it as, as a locality, the more special it becomes. And um, Nant Bran has turned out to be a very special place uh, in terms of the individual species that it contains, but also the community of species, the ecosystem uh, that it represents. And I think that's a, a general theme, really, that typical places are usually special in the end if you look at them hard enough and, and monitor them for long enough. And Coidnant Bran, thankfully, is, is uh, secured forever now for education, research and teaching, and it's being well used um, by uh, students from Cardiff University, University of South Wales, and the University of West of England uh, for those purposes. So the, uh, the next phase really is to uh, keep adding uh, long-term projects um, to, to um, set up um, projects that will re really run for decades and I'm, I'm planning to be uh, helping with that monitoring until I'm about, around about 100 and then I think I'll retire. But there's also scope for uh, short projects and we've had various masters and, and PhD projects carry out their field work within the wood uh, in, in relatively short focused uh, bursts as well. Along the way, we've uh, been able to add a little bit of uh, infrastructure. It started with a, a, a log that we dragged out of the river. That was, that was our seat. Um, and uh, then a canopy got added over the seat. And now the canopy is a, a lovely um, birdring shelter, fieldwork shelter with straw bale seatings. You can make a cup of tea, um, bird food and, and uh, a nice, um, nice setup for students to come and carry out ecological research. The woodland is extremely steep, so um, we've ha had to add um, um, steps. These, these are the Rob Thomas Memorial Steps and uh, a lovely hammock to contemplate uh, the meaning for your results in. Uh, we also have a notice board to uh, keep the local um, folks uh, informed as to what's going on in the woodlands, uh, what's been seen recently, and lots of folks from the village walk their dogs and um, go for walks along the lane alongside the woods, so it's, it's a great way of keeping in touch uh, with the projects going on inside the woodland. And people are welcome to, to walk through the woods as well. Um, there, there's not really uh, paths as such, um, but it's, it's open to the public to, to have a walk through if they want. So if you're interested to follow the fortunes in Mount Brown Wood, it's got its own Facebook page, it's um, also got a, a Twitter hashtag, um, or if you're interested to, to visit, uh, drop me an email and uh, I, can, I can send you um, the location and, and some visiting details. So that's the um, extent of the area that uh, we currently um, manage. Uh, there is a northern section uh, which may come onto the market in, in the next few years uh, as it comes out to the next round of agri-environment scheme. Uh, so this is potentially of interest for a future crowdfunding uh, exercise to try and add um, the, the top section um, so that the, the woodland as a whole, as a whole unit, uh, is then part of the, the monitoring and protection um, 
that currently exists for the southern part. So let's have a look now at a couple of other case studies of crowdfunding uh, for conservation. We're going to leave Wales now uh, to look at the Tamar Meadows, which is um, a set of meadows on the border of Devon and Cornwall along the, the river Tamar. And um, this is part of the world um, where uh, quite a well-known conservationist called Derek Gowes. Derek is one of his favourite study species, the beaver. Um, apparently Derek is supposed to look like a beaver, who knows. Um, and um, Derek uh, is a farmer um, down in, in Cornwall and um, would drive past these meadows from time to time and one day noticed that they'd come onto the market and uh, he put a, a tweet up on, on Twitter um, saying, I wish we could save these meadows before it gets sold and, and turned into just another sort of bright green, heavily fertilised uh, pasture land. So I noticed that tweet and, and suggested to, to Derek that we set up a, uh, a crowd fund and um, we set up a, a crowd fund for 25,000, which uh, would, would then cover the, um, the asking price and, and some uh, land management around that. The crowdfund itself um, raised £16,000, which was impressive in itself, uh, but it also attracted the attention of two major contributors who agreed to underwrite the cost of the, the meadow purchase, um, so to fill in the gap um, between the asking price and whatever the uh, crowdfund itself was able to raise. And just like with the, the Nantbran uh, Woodland crowdfunder, um, the, the crowdfunder itself is, is an interesting beast in that the, the average donation is, is relatively small, so about £25 per donation um, on average for Coid Nantbran, £23 on average uh, for, for the Tamar Meadows. So it's basically a lot of um, people adding a relatively small amount, an understandably small amount, because we don't have all have lots of money to throw around. But the um, interest shown by the crowd of crowdfunders is evidence that you know, there is a groundswell of support for um, a local purchase, and that um, seems to encourage uh, major contributors, uh, in this case, two major contributors, to, to underwrite the purchase. And so uh, that all went ahead. Uh, this is the location of the, the meadow, it's uh, near a little village called Pancras Week and uh, just on the Devon, Devon and Cornwall border, not too far from Bude, which many of you will know, and uh, it's just on the Devon side and uh, zooming in, um, the meadow itself is this tiny little fragment, uh, here's the river Tamar snaking its way uh, southwards and this is uh, the meadow here, it's just a little fragment of ancient uh, wet meadow, very diverse um, flower rich um, meadow in a sea of heavily fertilised bright green fields, uh, which Derek Gow was fearing uh, these um, biodiverse meadows would be turned into. So zooming in, um, you can see that this is, this is the uh, A road, it's actually quite a small patch um, but a very, very valuable patch of a, a, a relic of um, ancient grassland, uh, wet meadow um, that would have covered vast areas of Devon and Cornwall um, in previous centuries, but has now uh, almost completely disappeared. So this um, again is, is saved forever now and um, it's a little island of biodiversity, but um, one of the ideas for its future use is to use it um, in order to reseed um, meadows with wildflowers of local origin by taking cuts of hay in late summer uh, from these meadows and then strewing the hay on meadows that, that um, other farmers might want to, um, to, to reseed um, in a, in a um, conservation format. Um, so that's uh, part of the future management, but for now, in the first year of the site, um, it's in a, a bio-blitz kind of phase, finding out what's there. Uh, this is one of my field assistants, uh, Bryony Thomas, my daughter, and uh, here we are on our first visit to the meadow on our summer holidays, 
and uh, really being amazed at how rich um, in terms of flora, but also fauna um, the, the site is. It's got the River Tamar as one of its boundaries and uh, lots of um, freshwater invertebrates, of course, in the river. And uh, here are some views of the, the meadows, um, very rich, uh, dense stands of chest high vegetation. And uh, this, this would be uh, left to grow over the summer and then uh, a late season cut of hay taken for that, that reseeding purpose uh, for other meadows. So it all started um, pretty much exactly a year ago, uh, the 5th of October uh, last year is when, when uh, the meadow came onto the market and uh, the transactions are now all completed and um, it's led to um, the setup of a, a trust to uh, look after the meadow uh, in perpetuity. Uh, Derek Gow is one of the trustees and, and various other local people. Um, and that, that's been the key really is to have um, the local community involved in, in acquiring, but also taking on the site for the long-term management. And associated with that um, acquisition of the Tamar Meadows is um, some supplementary crowdfunding uh, because um, the, the site is suitable, it seems, for uh, reintroduction of glowworms, these little invertebrates with glowing bottoms, and um, part of Derek Gow's um, team involved in um, captive breeding of, of uh, native species for uh, reintroduction programs um, is Peter Cooper, who's a specialist in cap captive breeding uh, invertebrates. And so Peter is breeding up um, baby glowworms um, for uh, release at Tamar Meadows if it, if it turns out to be a suitable site for them uh, and also elsewhere. So uh, we're doing some additional crowdfunding uh, to, to keep that, um, that uh, captive breeding um, and, and re-release, reintroduction uh, side of things uh, topped up. And the final case study uh, that I want to talk about is one that is very much current. Um, this uh, young lady is Sophie Lee Williams, uh, one of our PhD students at the uh, Cardiff School of Biosciences. And Sophie is just coming to the end of a PhD project, uh, looking at the possibilities of reintroducing eagles to Wales. Um, it's the Eagle Reintroduction Wales project is Sophie Lee's brainchild. And um, her PhD is focused on the, the um, establishing um, the history of eagles in Wales and showing that both golden eagles and white-tailed eagles are uh, native to Wales and through archaeological, um, observational and place name evidence piecing together uh, the likely geographical of both golden and white-tailed eagles in historic Wales. And the next phase of Sophie's project is to move into a um, a consultation phase um, looking at the feasibility of reintroducing these eagles, um, which of course needs the, uh, the cooperation and approval of local communities. And uh, Sophie herself is from Aberdeer and uh, she's um, very much um, involved now in setting up uh, the next phase of the project and, and that is being partly uh, crowdfunded it's a little bit out of date um, in terms of the total, so three and a half thousand pounds so far, and that's being tied in then with grant applications uh, for postdoctoral uh, research on this uh, to, to um, move towards, if suitable, longer term, uh, an application uh, submission for a reintroduction license for the two species of eagles. But again, um, coming from within Wales and uh, very much tied to the local communities uh, within Wales. So what have we learned from these different experiences of crowdfunding uh, at Nant Bran Wood, at the Tamar Meadows and for the Eagle Reintroduction Wales uh, project? Well, there are the common themes that we can draw and um, some take home messages that might uh, perhaps um, encourage uh, folks to consider this as a, an approach to conservation in the future. Um, 
And also, you know, these are reflections on how things have gone with these three projects. It's not to say that uh, this is how every crowdfunding project would pan out. Um, but I, I think the reflections uh, that we can um, make use of and uh, understand sort of some of the, the reasons why crowdfunding might be uh, an effective approach, at least in some circumstances. So one of the themes is that the average donations um, made through the crowdfunding websites are actually you know, relatively small, between 20 and 25 pounds on average across the three projects uh, that I've talked about today. Um, and I, I think, you know, I've got quite fond of that result in that um, it shows that the people supporting um, these projects are not necessarily, you know, hugely wealthy individuals. They're people giving a little bit, it's as much as they can give, and that um, mounts up across a large crowd of people to be a pretty substantial amount. And so um, I think it's an encouragement to say that you don't have to give very much in order to make a very big difference. And, and the other um, theme, perhaps, uh, to mention is that you don't have to give anything to um, make quite a big impact with these crowdfunders because sharing the campaign on social media, telling friends about it and so on, um, is, is also very valuable because that's how the word gets out, that's how the message reaches across uh, different uh, communities, different parts of the country and um, builds support for their campaign. So even if you can't give anything, you can still um, help very much with the crowdfunding enterprise. And if you can give a little bit, that's really valuable because if there are a lot of people giving a little bit, then that builds up to a large amount. And that the contributions, the shares on social media, the donations, demonstrates the strength of feeling, the strength of interest in the project, the support for the idea of and conserving a place for um, future generations, for, for our current wildlife, for fu our future wildlife. And that interest and support can be demonstrated through these um, shares and, and, and through donations, both at the local level, because place-based conservation, of course, needs and depends on local support but also at the national level these projects can catch the interest at, at the Wales level the UK level and it um, is a useful sort of demonstration I think of how um, individuals and, and groups of people can catch a vision for why conservation is important and make that conservation happen very effectively. Uh, another common theme across these um, crowdfunding enterprises is that the main crowdfund might not reach the targets and in one way or another um, for each of these three projects I've talked about today um, the online crowdfunding websites didn't reach the target um, it, each of them uh, generated you know, multiple thousands of pounds and demonstrated that strength of interest and support and local and national interest um, but they were important to draw the attention of major backers who then usually have got in touch individually and um, contributed money um, directly to the to the purchase of the land um, rather than through the crowdfunding website itself but they would never have got in touch if the crowdfunding website hadn't been up and running and attracting lots of donations from lots of individual people and contributing relatively small amounts because that's most people can contribute. Um, but the strength of interest demonstrates to those major backers that um, there is a lot of public support for what they themselves could then consider um, contributing to. And so those major backers have been absolute lifesavers as well as the individual small contributors also being absolute lifesavers for, for these projects. So um, the, the whole thing needs both kinds of people. And uh, we've seen here today three examples of, of um, people being incredibly generous with their money, uh, also with their time and their enthusiasm and their, their passion for, for making 
consolation happen in practice. So thanks for your attention today and um, uh, look forward to um, hearing more um, from other people about uh, successful crowdfunding of conservation in the future.